Okay. So uh, really the only reason we are having this school here, rather than you viewing similar lectures that already exist on the web, is because you're able to learn by interacting. Because otherwise it's pointless, you can just go swimming at night where it's not dark, you can watch th this video. And, and so really the only way you're going to be getting something much more than just from video or the textbooks, and you have here a representation of the best uh, experts in the fields in all different areas, is by interacting. So I really encourage you to ask questions, stop, and this is the only way you're going to get much more than people who can just view those videos. So summary from the uh, previous lecture, what you learned is the ideal chains, and I have the sample of the step of freely jointed chain. This is a ring, we're going to break it, so it's going to be a chain with the ends. So when the two sections come close together, the ideal is we assume there's no interactions between sections that are far away. You still assume there's some interaction between nearby, that's how you get this uh, dif difference between different, uh, like C infinity corrections due to stiffness. That's put in by putting some local interactions along the chain nearby uh, monomers, but far away monomers ignore interactions are completely ignored, and that's what ideal chains are. And what you've seen is one of the main results is that mean square distance between the ends is proportional to number of monomers, or number of we call effective monomers, Kuhn segments. And we're trying to use similar notation, so our Kuhn length is B. Typical value is about one nanometer. You've seen that. And uh, this probable distribution functions is uh, probability of that if one end of the chain is at origin, the other end is some vector R with a little cube d sub Rx, d sub Ry, d sub Rz. This is called Gaussian distribution, and you can see in many science museums if you have those balls falling through the pins, they form a Gaussian, and it's very similar to the chain with different bones pointing re left, right, or going in different random directions, and ma when many of them are doing it together, this is becomes a Gaussian. Some of you may actually recognize this from very, very long time before the Euro. Uh, to each mark had a Gauss and a Gaussian, and even the equation there. Let's see what goes on, I think this is... Uh, so, let's see. So the, f the logarithm of the free energy, the probability, the probabil logarithm of the probability to for two ends to be a certain distance r, is this free energy that's in ideal case is just proportional to the square. Well, the most important part is kt, as you already learned. This three half is something that we are not going to be typically skipping. And then the is proportional to the square of the end to end distance divided by the happy end to end distance, which is this average. And so, depending on how much larger than the average you are, stretching the chain, the free energy is going to be that much higher. And the derivative of this uh, free energy is the force. The Hooke's law is the, probabil uh, the force to pull the chain a certain distance, r, is proportional to, to the uh, r, and this coefficient, as you learned from the previous lecture, is the, is the, is the spring constant. Its most f f feature of this is that it's proportional to the therm temperature and divided by the mean square size of the chain, the mean square end to end distance. Any questions on this? Yes. This is a single spring, and if you think about the chain, this is the most important part from the whole course, is the chain is a little spring, and you're pulling it at any distance, no matter how small the distance is, it's under tension, and you're pulling it out, and the force is proportional to the distance. And that is the main uh, basis for entropic elasticity, for rubbers, all of that will come from this. There is no, that's the big difference between springs you're used to, when there is an equilibrium resting length. In the case of polymer, there is none. It's uh, 
would, this, as soon as you start, div, div, think about just one dimension. If you do it, okay. there's a difference between vector and, and distance. In terms of the vector, there is no equilibrium resting end because it's as likely to be to the right or to the left. And the highest probability here, as you see, is at zero projection. In terms of the distance, if you go from the Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates, there's going to be r square coming to 4 pi r square dr in front. And then there is actually going to be in distances, there is a happy distance but not in, in vectors or projections of forces. In that case, it's zero. But because of their very few states with very small distance, the, mac the maximum possible, the, av the average distance is non-zero. The optimal distance is not zero. But the optimal projection on any axis is zero. Any other questions before I move on? This is the most important part from the last lectures. And before we're going to other things, Ask questions. Okay. I need to turn off the. Yeah, high five. It's bugging me. Oh, yes, yeah, second. I'll try to. Okay, go ahead. The average distance is proportional to a uh, uh, square root of n, and there is a coefficient that I don't remember that has to do with the integral of the 4 pi r squared dr of this distribution. It's, it's, the, it's the second moment of the, of the distribution that gives you the average, the best average, well, the peak of the distance. It's not exactly the average distance. The average distance is also proportional to square root of n. The average end to end distance is is proportional to square root of n. The, if you look at distribution of distances, there is a peak that's also the order of square root of n. And, but in terms of projection, the maximum possible uh, probability is at zero for any three directions. That's the difference because of the number of states in the spherical coordinates is tiny when you write, write around the, uh, this is the first point. Okay. Yes. Can you interpret th this in terms of spring? No, no, string. String. Oh, strain. Yes, if you think about, uh, the problem with the strain is that we're already thinking about m continuum mechanics. And there you have to uh, be a little bit more careful because when you prepare your network, we'll get to this later this week, when you prepare your network, you already fixed some distance. And so strain would be the difference in deformation from initial distance to the next distance. And so in this case, you're not doing average of everything. This is a K for a liquid. Once you form a solid and define a strain for a solid, you'll need to talk about initial and final position. And so the strain would be the proportional to the difference between those. And the initial end-to-end -end distance, or initial end-to-end -end vector, is in a network, you think about you cross-link it here, it is not zero. So the strain would be how much I gain by deforming it, by stretching or compressing or something. And that will be a, a difference in, this dif in, the, in those distances, okay? So if we don't talk about strain for single chain, you can define for single chain, then this would be the deformation between initial and final ends. Because you don't, chain never starts at zero. And so it fluctuates like crazy like this. And so to define a strain, you need to f uh, use your uh, magnetic tweezer. You can put it at some distance, and then you deform it. But initially, in a liquid, it's just e everywhere. Say, Oops, I'm breaking my polymer. <laughs> so see, we see, see those bones sometimes reverse. We'll talk about that. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, or oh, Kuhn monomer. OK, so that's the unification of the idea of polymers in, uh, for different polymers, polystyrene, polybetadine, polyisoprene, uh, DNA, the effective stiffness or persistence, how if I go along, the, along the, my polymer before I forget the initial direction, is different. They have, they have different persistence lengths or different stiffnesses. So the Schoon monomer represents the effective stiffness of the chain, and this way you unify all polymers into the same language. 
So there's a table of what those cool monomers are for different, for different polymers. And then once you know what this B is, you can, it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with, with different chemical structures or different uh, uh, materials. You can it's described all in the same language. But so you can think about the Kuhn monomer is effectively how far, well, it's uh, the section of the chain and another section of the chain that are freely jointed. So if my polymer would be repre re replaced by completely freely jointed set of uh, joints, but has the same contour lengths and the same mean square end to end distance, what would be the se segment size? And that's called a Kuhn monomer. So you take your chain, you measure its contourless by knowing molecular weight and bond lengths. You measure mean square end to end distance and mean square size by scattering. And then I'm you're, you're mapping it on this ideal model by finding what would be my freely joined chain that has exactly the same contour lengths and size, ideal size. That's called Kuhn monomer. That's mapping all polymers on the, on the same description. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. So, uh, you so continue on. We define the dimensionalities of objects. If you have a regular object like a solid ball and its mass proportional to its volume and the volume proportional to the cube of the size, if you take a little spherical section of this ball, for this little section, you also have the same exact relationship. Its mass of little section is proportional to the cube of its size. And so we talk three-dimensional solids. Are th I mean, solid objects in our space are called three-dimensional because the mass is proportional to the cube of the size. If you take a piece of paper, uh, then mass of the piece of paper proportional to the square of the size. And that's why we call it almost two-dimensional. If you take a little sphere and you cut a section out of your paper, uh, the si uh, mass of the section will be proportional to the square of the size of the section. For a wire, if you take a piece of wire and you cut, take a sphere and take a s uh, s cut out a section of the wire of size r, the mass will be proportional to the radius or length of the wire of the section, and so it's called almost one dimension. I call it almost is because, and this is the plot we'll be using a lot, we're plotting the log of the mass of the section we are cutting, as a function of log of the size of the sphere I'm using to cut it out. And if, if the sphere or the size is large enough, I'll see for wire, I'll have a slope of the log, log plot will be a slope of one, so it says one dimension. If my sphere that I'm cutting becomes smaller than the diameter of my wire, I will be now cutting a three-dimensional metal pieces and then it becomes three-dimensional, there will be a crossover between those two. Uh, with a factor of two or something around this, and log-log scales will be almost noticeable. So there's a crossover from three-dimensional on small scale, smaller than the, the thickness of the wire, to one-dimensional on large scale. For the papers, it will be crossover from three-dimensional to two-dimensional. And I have here something for you to think about. This is the elastic rubber piece. And think about what will be the properties if I do the same construction for this. You'll go from one-dimensional to two-dimensional to three-dimensional because now there are two length scales. There is a width and a thickness. So think about how that would look like because in later when we talk about polymers, you'll see a lot of this type of crossovers on different length scales. And it's always useful to go back to simple principle where you can figure out what it is. You'll see a lot of pictures like this later on a log-log scale, different properties change or different st statistical properties modified. Any questions about this? So this is regular objects. We were talking about fractals, and so regular fractals are distracted in a simple way. This is one of the simplest ones. You take a, a line, sec a sector of, section of the line, cut, uh, divide it into three pieces, replace the middle one with two. So you go divide three pieces, now the mass is becomes four. I repeat the same procedure with each of those sections. So each of those four sections, you divide the three, three pieces and replace the middle bit with the two. And keep, keep going over and over and over again and it becomes very highly ramified object. And, you, and this object is called fractal. And so what is the main features of this fractal is when 
the, if the size is changed by a factor of three. So the your property of this is very similar. Uh, you want to find out how, if I take a sphere and cut a s size r and cut a section out of it, how does the mass of my section depends on the size of a sphere? And so this dimensionality here relates how, uh, uh, exp uh, how mass is proportional to size to this power d, but in analogy with what we were doing here with regular objects. Very similar to what we were doing here. So in this construction, when I change size by a factor of three, I change mass by a factor of four. And so it means that four is three to the power d, or this d, fractal dimensionality, is the ratio of a log, you take log of both sides, it's a log of four divided by log three, which is about 1.3, 1.26. So for this very simple object, it's, it's straightforward to calculate fractal dimensionality, or how does the mass changes with the size of the object. So if at each little section here, the size changes factor of 10, mass would change by factor of 10 to the power 1.26. Uh, the reason we are talking about this is because polymers and a lot of other soft matter for that are fractal and for very deep physical reason. And so uh, we want to understand their structure based on this how mass or sp uh, changes with the length scale. The difficulty is the self-similarity for regular fractals like this is very, s each section looks identical to each other section. It's a very regular object. Polymers and other things like cauliflower is not extremely regular, but it also self-similar. If I take a piece of cauliflower and blow it up, it looks like the whole thing. If I take a piece of it and blow up, it looks, I mean, it looks self-similar. But it's not exactly the same. So the pr it's, a s it's a magnified object looks similar in a statistical way. So if I do averages of the mass of many, many pieces, and somebody did this experiment, did the measurement, you have to average, cut pieces of the same size and measure their mass many, many, many times. On average, is proportional to s uh, size to the power d with the d is 2.8 for cauliflower. The reason for this is this polymer is not always in the same conformation. Conformation changes all the time. And so I cannot just say that a given section exactly equal to the mass to some power because it's the thickness changes. So it's only on average or many, many uh, configurational dance of this polymer, you're going to get this relationship. So statistical properties are determined by this way, but not as in a regular way as you had previously on regular fractal. So there's a difference between regular fractals and random fractals like polymers or cauliflower or many other things. Any questions about yes? Slightly less, right. Mass is if each of those, if this is made out of wire and of the same thickness, then the mass would be, in this case, the mass would be the length, because I'm assuming the thickness of the wire is the same. So in this case, the mass is, not, uh, is, the, is, is equivalently the length of this fractal. But in principle, if it's made out of the same wire, I would just weigh it. Well, by construction. Right. Right. Or you can measure it. You can take somebody didn't tell you how to start. You can they give you this final object. You cut into pieces. You put on a scale and you measure. You measure the length. You measure the weight. And you and you, dis and you plot. So experimentally, you can also do it if you don't know how it was constructed. And that's actually how for cauliflower it was done. It, it's n people didn't. I mean, it's, it's biologically you can make a model of how cauliflower grows, but in, but uh, experimentally, just take a pieces and you weigh. Or you can look at some other, like the shape of the bay in, 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 in uh, some very fractal uh, landscapes. And you can also do the measurement directly because it's the you have to study geology to find out why it's formed this way. The reason things are, are self-similar is because the same physical principles work on different length scales. For polymer, this probability of going left, right randomly is true for a 
Kuhn segment, for five Kuhn segments, for a hundred Kuhn segments. So if, if it's constructed the same way on all different length scales, it looks the same way on different length scales. So as long as the physics is scale independent, you're going to get a fractal. And so our ideal polymer, and we saw this, uh, it was in a case there is no inter interaction at all. It's the same as the, as the trajectory of a random drunk. And uh, it makes random steps left and right. And so in this case, mean square, this is a proportional number of steps. Or the mass proportional to size to a power ID. And in fact, dimensionality for, for ideal polymer is 2. And you already learned that in polymer melts, where you have no solvent at, at all, people observe. And there is a theory explaining why for dimensionality is equal to 2. It turns out there are also some solutions, some very special conditions for the solvent. When we we'll learn that when attraction and repulsion cancels, you also get, are going to get something similar to fractal dimensionality of uh, 2. So uh, if you compare the fractal dimensionality of a polymer with the space dimension we typically live in, which is 3, there is plenty of other space around inside the polymer available for something else. Lots of solvent can fit in, other polymers can fit in, so it occupies only a very small fraction of this volume, which is very, very important to, we'll use it a lot later. And the reason it's fractal, as I said, is because the same principle, which is in this case for ideal chain is just random, completely uncorrelated choice of a direction, occurs on all different scales, and so that's why if you take a polymer, uh, half of the polymer, or a tenth of the polymer, or any other sections, if you're going to construct random directions, you're going to get the same structure. And that's why it's, it's, it's a self-similar object in this case. So what fractal means is you take magnified part of the polymer and blow it up. It looks the same statistically as, uh, as the whole object. So size proportional to mass proportional to size square, average, or size is proportional to mass to power nu. And we're going to be using a lot this exponent nu, which is one of fractal dimension, because typically people, uh, mass doesn't change with conditions. But polymer can swell and dissolve, so size does change with conditions, if you have kind of polymer. So people typically measure mass, uh, no mass, and measure the size. So, so this is a reciprocal relation to this one. And uh, the exponent we'll be using exchangeably would be size proportional to mass to power nu, which is a half ideal change, like in a melt, or mass proportional to size squared. So we'll see both capital D, which is dimensionality, or nu, which is reciprocal. Any questions so far? This is a review of what we saw before. OK. So what are real chains? The difference between ideal chain and real chain is that in, this, in real chains, we actually care uh, about interactions. When two monomers or two sections of the chain come together, they may repel each other, they may attract each other, they may do something to each other. And so uh, it's like going from ideal gas to real gas or liquids or some other things. We start worrying about interactions. And we really care about those mostly that are far along the chain to different parts far along the chain when they encounter each other in space. And those are the important interactions that control the properties on the polymer, at least initially on larger scales. And so why do we care about them and when do we come about this? We can estimate is why they're important. And to do that, we're constructing probability for one monomer, say in this case will be my, this monomer here, this, uh, let's say this little green monomer, of being in contact with any other monomer in my chain. So I have many, many monomers in the chain. I am with this green, I'm sitting with this green monomer and I try to find out what's the probability some other monomer comes close to me so I have to worry about interactions. And that's probability, so I have uh, this m m yellow monomer here. Sorry, it was supposed to be yellow. So I have this yellow monomer here that has some volume, and B is the size, like Kuhn lengths. And now I'm thinking about, in general, the dimensionality. Little d is dimensionality of space. You can think about d equals 3 when it's in, in solutions. You can think about d equals 2 when you're doing something on an interface between liquids and gas, or between two liquids or on a surface. So D is a space dimension, and the effective volume is B to the D. And the probability that other monomer comes close to me is number of monomers divided by the volume of my chain. R to the D is the volume of the chain. N of R D is number density of other monomers. And the probability any monomer is there. If you just completely ignore interrelations, I take my chain, I cut them into, into monomers. 
And that's what mean field assumptions do. do so they cut your chain into little monomers like this. They put them inside, inside a, a box of the size of the chain. And I'm not going to put it here because there's real water that they want to drink. But the probability is going to be the product of the volume times number density. And so if, if this polymer is a fractal with fractal dimensionality d, the size proportional to b to the power uh, times n to the power 1 over d, remember this is this reciprocal uh, fractal dimensionality, so it's 1 over d. You plug this into here, you're going to get that this, what I call phi star, this is a very, very important property. It's called the overlap concentration. We'll learn about it later in, in the course. Uh, it's proportional to n to the power 1 from numerator and minus little d over capital D from denominator. So this quantity here, the sign of this exponent tells you whether this phi is going to be large or small. And for three dimensional, if little d is three dimensions, and capital D is two with the ideal chains, you're going to get one minus three half. And so this quantity here, phi star, is proportional to n to the uh, one square of n, which is very small for large n. So the probability of your monomer Encountering any other monomer is very, very small. Uh, yes. Um, uh, far, um, in far along the chain, but when they get close in space. You can include neighbors as well. It's not going to change much. You can include neighbors as well, but typically there is some stiffness, so that you have to worry about correlations. So that's why we're talking, uh, and most of the contacts in are between, if you count how many contacts by far away monomers, it's proportional to number of monomers square. If you talk how many contacts between neighboring monomers, it's going to be proportional to some small number. So most of the contacts are going to be between pairs are due to far away. But you can include all of them. It doesn't matter. It's just nearby c contacts. I take into account, and you have a correlation to take into account is in the stiffness of effects or some p p reduced probability of forming a tiny loops. And that's encountered to is what we call C infinity or this parameter B. This B already accounts for this little uh, yeah. possibility. So we are only talking about far away contacts. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so what you found is that my monomer is very rarely in the simple approximation in contact with other monomers. So why do we care about interactions? Do you understand my question? We just showed that if I am a yellow monomer sitting here in a chain, I re really rarely see any other monomers. The probability of seeing other monomers is 1 square of n. If n is 10 to the 8, it's going to be almost never. So why aren't chains always ideal? Why do we care about interactions? And the answer is because there are many monomers. And all we care about is the total number of contacts. I am seeing something else very rarely, but many, many other monomers are there. And if you count how many contacts are there at any moment of time, you have to multiply this probability by number of monomers. And this counts total number of contacts. And so the, it, it brings another power of n to the numer numerator. So it's now 2 minus d over t, uh, little d over capital D. And so if your little d is bigger than 2, two capital D, then this quantity is exponent is negative, and this probability is very small. So if your dimensionality of space is bigger than 2 times fractal dimension, the way to think about this is you have two, uh, two half of your chain, have fractal dimensionality of d and d, and when they overlap, uh, you, the probability of n n the number of contacts is just sum of two fractal dimensionalities. If space dimension is bigger than sum of two fractal dimensionality, there is plenty of space for those fractal to go through itself and it's transparent to itself. So if little deal like space dimension, which is in our case typically three, is will be bigger than two times little d, so if, little, if capital D is like one and a half or less, then there will be no problem with, with interactions. It will be ideal-like. Unfortunately, capital D is two, and so in our two dimensions, we end having difficulty. So our three-dimensional space is smaller than two times fractal dimensionality. It means there are many, many contacts, number of contacts proportional to square root of n, if it was ideal. 
So my chain, if each monomer is really contacting somebody else, but my chain overall has square root of number of contacts. And that could be a very large energy. If each contact costs KT, it's going to be very, very expensive for this. So this explains why you have to be worrying about, so in linear chain, it has capital D is two, in three dimensions, has, uh, is, you, you have to worry about, it's a peg. It's, you, the two halves see each other a lot. You have to go in spaces above four dimensions at least, which we haven't learned, so I hope some of you will learn how to do experiments in spaces close to four, above four dimensions. Then you'll be able to see ideal chains always. But in three-dimensional spaces, interactions are very, very important, and so we have to uh, account for them. Any questions? This is the justification why real chains are important, or real interactions, why I need to account for interactions. Why chains not ideal? Yes. Okay, what transparent and peg means is that if I have a fractal dimensionality D here, and another fractal, or second half of my fractal, has to have fractal dimensionality, and if I try to put them in the same amount of sp uh, same volume of space, if they, don't see, if they don't see each other, meaning there's no contacts, we call it transparent. If they see each other, uh, we call it a peg. So it's not in terms of you viewing through it, it's more like one of them seeing the other half. It, it, it can be generalized by two different fractals. If you have fractal with D1 and D2, coming together, if some of the fractal dimensionality is, is bigger than the space dimensions, they will not fit. If they're smaller, they can fit in other, in, in, within each other without any interactions. Other questions? Yes. One, two, and three D is something very easy for us to observe. Going above is experimental, a little difficult. It's, it's theoretically very important because as you see with 4D, it becomes ideal, so you can start to think, what if 4D ideal and if going down to 3, how much my, my behavior changes. So the calculations that are, uh, are people have done, I'm not going to talk about them today, are done by doing expansion around ideal chain in four dimensions, doing it for minus epsilon expansion. So thinking epsilon is dimensionality. Experiment in simulation, you can do it. In experiments, we haven't figured out yet how to go to four dimensions. Maybe somebody will. Oh, fractal dimensionality could be anything. Uh, in fact, we'll talk later in the course about fractal dimensionality of four, which is very important for, for gels, so gelation. Fractal dimensionality could be infinity, or very, very, very large. If you think about making uh, something called starburst polymers, where you're doing trifunctional monomers, and reacting them together, AB2, for example, or AB3, or ABN, and do it regularly, step by step by step, you call something called dendrima, regular dendrima, starburst, its fractal dimensionality is infinite. So, but you cannot grow, I mean, the problem is, is that when you have fractal dimensionality too large, it's sometimes very hard to fit it in real space. And we'll talk about that as well. How, how much you can fit in real space for three dimensions, object, four dimensional object. And you can, and we, have, we do it, but for a while it can do it, and then it runs out of space. Yes, sir. So then that last question made me think about um, uh, gaskets, so fractals with fractal dimensions that are fractional between two and three. Yes. Oh yes, yes. There's a, there's a lot of lot of simulations and work on that. A lot of math phys mathematical physicists love to do this, and I can give you lots of references to this work. Yes, uh, this was a lot of some work was done in Germany. Yeah, a lot of, lot of I mean th that was very popular in nineties, late eighties. A lot of work was done on this. Yes. Yes. It depends on interaction range. Typical interaction range is, you can think about Van der Waals interaction, so we're thinking about getting close, and we'll talk about it in more detail in the next slide, but when it's within, uh, within interaction range, and, and you have to worry about this in electrolytes, interaction becomes very large and it becomes different, but you typically have salt, so you have like the bilength screens, so you can think about within the bilengths. So it within, within this, start energetically feeling each other. And typically it's nanometer, so we're assuming it's on the order of B, but yes, you have to worry about interaction range. So this is actually what we are talking about now. So think about your solution or other or polar melt and talk about two, two monomers. And they have some kind of attraction potential between them. And this is uh, 
typically don't like to be on top of each other. There is a Pauli exclusion principle. The electronic clouds don't like to overlap. So probability of them overlapping physically on top of each other is very, very low. And so energy is diverges when they get very, very close. And typically, when they are some distance apart, there actually is almost always some a little bit of attraction. And there are a lot of uh, physical reasons for it. So induced polarization, van der Waals forces. So there's a typical attractive well and, and a hardcore repulsive uh, core. And further out, there is almost no interaction. So this is typical potential, but this is not a potential between a pair of monomers. It's a potential between a pair of monomers, but pair of atoms of mo in a sea of other monomers. So if you're thinking about what is the energy as I move my mon two, two monomers in the, in the solvent, closer together and further apart, or in the sea of whatever media you have, not in vacuum. Typically, polym polymers don't like to live in vacuum. I mean, you can put them in vacuum to kind of attract too strongly to each other. So we're thinking about in a solution or in a, in a melt of other polymers in, in, a, in some kind of media. And so you can find a probability to find those two monomers, the relative probability to find those two monomers of distance r, and I'm normalizing it by monomer size b or Kuhn's length. And the probability is zero or very close to zero when they overlap. It's a pro relative probability far away, with respect to far away, with no interaction, as we call it one. It's a relative probability. And this is just a Boltzmann weight. This probability is exponential of the energy divided by kt. Remember, this kt is one of the most important parameters in soft matter. And so we have enhanced probability when they attract and so reduced probability when they repel. And then this um, f function, my f function, is defined as the difference between this relative probability and the probability with no interaction. So I subtract one from this. So far away, it's zero. When you attr have attraction, it's positive. When you have repulsion, it's negative. So this is the relative probability <laughs> of finding two monomers at a certain distance. Any questions about how it's constructed? Yes? Uh, this is dimensionless. It's not unnormalized dimensional quantity. Uh, I'm talking, so how more likely, okay, so make me more rigorous. How more likely am I to find two monomers at distance r within the volume dr1, dr2, dr3, with respect to, s to, to the same two monomers far away when they're not interact? With respect to case when they're not interacting. So it's, it's an enhancement or reduction of probability compared to no interaction, to ideal case. So this is would be ideal case would be one here or zero here, which is the ideal polymer, ideal monomers, ideal gas. And this is enhancement compared to ideal gas or subtraction with respect to ideal gas. It's the same exact volume. So we're comparing to the case of no interaction. And, uh, the and then the moments of this distribution of, uh, are very important. So the, the just the average of the whole volume of this Mayer function tells you how more likely or less likely you are to find those two monomers near each other compared to ideal if no interaction case. If this uh, repulsion dominates, they are less likely to be next to each other in, this, in some nearby volume. If the attraction dominates, they will be more likely compared to ideal gas. So this quantity here is overall single parameter that tells you how you have, how likely two, two monomers be in some neighborhood around each other. Not, not necessarily overlapping, but somewhere nearby. And so that's how we define solvents. So this is the definition of a screwed volume. It's a minus integral of this Mayer function. And I remind you what Mayer function is. Is the relative probability of finding two monomers at distance r compared to no interactions. And so if there is only repulsion, no attraction at all, this probability is, or Mayer function is negative, and the excluded volume is positive because of this minus sign. And so this is an integral that would give you something like a volume of a monomer. So this will be excluded volume in case of just more uh, just pure repulsion with no attraction. If there's additionally some attraction, but repulsion dominates, this integral uh, of vo excluded volume will be still positive, but less than b cube, and we call it a good solvent. And then there's a magic point. This magic point is when the attraction and repulsion overall cancel. And this is, in this case, this model predicts that this uh, polymers or monomers behave as if you are ideal. They, they really interact. 
they don't like to overlap, and they do like to be nearby, but this x time they, they miss overlapping, they gain nearby. Overall, it's as if they don't see each other. So think about two, two monomers flying towards each other, or swinging towards each other, and then they dance a little bit nearby and pass by, and the pro time they spend together would be the same as if they don't see each other. And so this is this magic, con uh, in guesses it's called boil point, here it's called theta temperature or theta point, and it corresponds to the case where the chains are almost ideal. It ignores connectivity, and so there's other corrections that I'm not going to talk about due to the chain connectivity, it's because we cut our monomers into pieces, if we don't think, don't think of them being connected th through the chain. And then we do it to the other side, if attraction dominates over repulsion, this excluded volume parameter would be negative, and we go to pore solvents, and typically, this corresponds to higher temperature, this corresponds to lower temperature, but sometimes in water, in many cases, you have things reversed. Yes? What? Oh. Oh, solvent. Okay, so if you remember, this was a potential in a given, uh, in, a, in a medium of a solvent. So all, all this other, so this is energy interaction of these two monomers, compared to surrou being surrounded by something else. So if they're surrounded by something else which they like more, they would like to be surrounded by, or if they li like less, for example, if blue and blue doesn't like white, they like to be near each other, and it corresponds to poor solvent. If, uh, and so if blue is your monomers, and this is water, polystyrene doesn't like water, they would like to stick together. So this potential here is not just interaction of blue and blue in vacuum, interaction of blue and blue in a medium. And the solvent is the medium that controls the shape of the potential. Other questions? So this is the ma main contact. So uh, any questions on, on the con con this concept? So polymer life is a balance. It's a balance between entropy, and entropy is essential for the, for the uh, soft matter, as you heard, and the energy. And uh, so Entropy always wants to be changed to be as ideal, close to ideal as possible because its number of states in ideal state is maximum. It wants to be as close to ideal like. And energy typically wants something else. For example, if it's in a good solvent, they like to be surrounded by solvent and not to be close to each other. So they repel effectively. And so chain has to find some compromise. And it's sometimes hard, sometimes easy, and so what the, the rest of this lecture today will be how you find the compromise between what entropy wants to do and what, and what the energy wants to do. And so the simplest model uh, of doing this, finding this compromise was developed by Flory. It's called Flory theory. And so the way that goes is you take your chain and use scissors and cut them to pieces and mix those pieces in this volume of a chain, exactly as we did before. Same procedures we did 10 mi 20 minutes ago. And so you just treat it as an unconnected solution with some number density, number of monomers divided by volume. So you're thinking about this solution, and you find out what is the energy of this interaction between all of those monomers swimming in this solution. And the only parameter we have is, C, uh, is concentration, and they sometimes collide, and when they collide, they have uh, energy of, of interaction of, uh, depending on the excluded volume, times kT, so it's a C squared probability of two boy collisions. And then you worry about cases if its concentration is, is not too low, sometimes three monomers will be together, and be, when the three monomers are together, there will be some other interaction called three body interactions, and you can go to this high, high ex order expansion. So this is an expansion of interaction energy in powers of concentrations if C is not too high. And if it's very low, you can stop at this term, but eventually you may need to worry about high order terms. This is called virial expansion for gases and for solutions. It accounts for all the interactions. Any questions about this? And then, uh, in addition to energy, energetic type of interaction, some of it might be entropic in origin, the chain, because it's connected, has its own conformational energy. It wants to be as close to the deal as possible. Remember from this Gaussian, we, we discussed this... Uh, okay, sorry. Before going there, we're going to first do the... At very low concentrations, we can ignore these terms, and we're going to just keep the first term here, which is the two-body term. 
and we're going to start with positive v, and so we're just going to say that v times c c is n of r cube, c square is n square of r6, times the volume of the shape, because this is energy density, we're going to get a simple expansion expression for the interaction. So this expression here just counts two body interactions of the monomers of the chain in a very, very mean field approximations. n square is number of possible contacts, and divided by r cubed counts, it tells you how likely they are. Proportional to c square times r cubed. And this is the V tells you what is the cost of, of entropy cost of contact, or energetic cost of contact. And then what I started telling you about is there is a free energy of the chain, and the chain, when you try to swelling it or stretching it, it has fewer states. And this term here tells you how less, what, how much chain is going to hate swelling or stretching, and it's proportional to how much bigger its size compared to its happy size, times kt. So there are two terms of the, uh, of, of the balance. Energy wants c to be as small as possible, meaning it wants change to swell, so probability of contact is very low, and entropy wants to be as close as possible to Gaussian. And so the Flory approximation, in a very, very simple way, it has a balance of entropy, which is, tells you how much it hates being swollen, and energy, which tells you how much energy will be if it is not very much swollen. So this is the cost of attraction. Yes? Not in vacuum. Entropy part is ideal chain, so it's an it's, it's interaction, of, it's a chain with no interaction. Uh, I don't think solvent matters if there's no interaction. If the, if, if the, what entropy term does is counts number of possible states each, bo uh, each bond of a chain can be in, and it finds the uh, pr probable distribution, which is Gaussian, and finds what is the best state. In vacuum, you, cannot, uh, you already have interactions, because monomers would see each other, they would like to be in contact with each other much more than with nothing, and so the vacuum chain collapses into a globular, and it's not really soluble. The small v is tells you how mo more or less likely is uh, my chain. So it's, it comes from this definition here. So let me go to the slide here. Small v tells me how much I hate to be overlapping co compared to how much I like to be nearby. And so if small b is positive, it means that my repulsion due to high core is much more important than attraction, so I don't want to be next. I try to avoid overlap. So in case of no attraction at all, for example, if I only have repulsion, it just means that I have to avoid being overlapping completely, and this is what von der Waals did with his ideal gas law, correcting to ideal gas law, he accounted for excluded volume due to uh, monomers, or so gas molecules. Gas molecules that like to be on top of each other, that adds excluded volume, and so this small v is effective excluded volume that monomer, uh, or so molecule avoid from other molecule. It's the function of solvent because it, it matters what this, what this bump is. It's a subtraction of the, uh, of the hard core contribution and the attractive contribution. And if the attractive contribution is large, like in, uh, in vacuum, there's a huge head van der Waals force. Then this term gains, and, and they just like to stick together. Even though they're not going to be overlapping, they're going to be sticking next to each other. So overall, it will be, we will be very, very negative. Other questions? OK. So by minimizing this free energy, you're just equating those two terms. You take a derivative. You find that the solution is... Uh, uh, the size of the chain is increased from n to the power one half to n to the power three fifths. The exponent is different. It depends on v and the monomer size b. So you get this very important universal relation. So the size is proportional to the number of moments to the power nu, and this new exponent, by solving this to, to minimizing this free energy, is about 0.6. Or fractal dimensionality is about uh, 1.7. So it is smaller fractal dimensionality than two chain is bigger. This new exponent is larger, so chain is swollen. Fractal dimensionality is smaller. So uh, they're reciprocal of each other. 
And that's the solution of the flurry for this uh, simple two-body problem, or sorry, so, so simple midfield approximation. Any question? I'm going to do the exercise now in generalizing this, but this is the main principle. You calculate interaction in some very simple, ignoring connectivity. You take a cost of uh, swelling by how much free energy is reduced compared to ideal, and balance the two. And this is really magical, and that's what a much more accurate calculation that gives you 0.588. And this is really a magical calculation because both of those terms are extremely incorrectly approximated. It's significantly over overestimated both terms, and somehow the errors cancel. Nobody completely understands why and how, but this, this principle, method works a lot. I apply it a lot, and it works in many, many cases. Sometimes it fails, but more often it works. Any attempts to improve in it bring us to much worse result. So uh, now we're going to do something similar in a slightly more general case. So let's consider a general fractal. You have n monomers connected, like say a branch problem or something else, in general dimensionality d. And we're assuming that d sub 0 is ideal fractal dimensionality of this fractal. So if there was no interaction at all, it was up to entropy, it would like to have this size, where proportional to n to the power of 1 over d0. But now there are interactions. Interaction will have excluded the volume V sub D. We put this fractal uh, in the dimensionality D, and we are going to write this free energy in a very, very simple, similar form. It's the entropic cost for swelling compared to ideal state. And we have this two-body repulsion between monomers to exclude the volume parameter V sub D. This is the simplest form of Flory theory. And we are generalizing it for this fractal. So we're plugging in, or we can for our R0, this R B times n to the power 1 over d, so we have n to the power 2 over d0. Uh, here we have this d-dimensional concentration. You take a derivative, you minimize, and you find the answer is the size proportional to n to the power 2 plus 2 over d0 divided by d plus 2. This is very general result. We're going to use it later for branch polymers, in gelation, many other cases. Uh, in any dimensionality. This is a Flory prediction in general. And so for ideal chain, linear chain, d0 is 2, you plug in 2 here. What you find is that this Flory exponent, this is a general result for any fractal. For linear chain with fractal dimensionality 2 ideal 2, d0 is 2, you get 3 over d plus 2. So this is the, your, res your result. This is the uh, exponent nu, 3 over d plus 2, or it's one over fractal dimension. And uh, this is your space dimension. And what you see is that it starts for d, uh, it one dimensional space is 1, 3 over 3. In two dimensional space, it comes out to be, to be what you find is that it goes down to 2, 1 half. So, fact dimensionality is 2 in four dimensions. And you remember we talked about two dimensional ideal fractals. 2 twice 2 gives you 4, so in four dimensions, they become ideal. So by the time it gets to four-dimensional chain, it becomes ideal. In three-dimensional, you get uh, this fi uh, five uh, three-fifths. And it turns out to be, so this four is called, uh, four-dimensional is called upper critical. In this case, chain is, becomes ideal. Lowest dimensionality could be one, because that's when you have a fully stretched chain. And in two dimensions, this a magical flooring method gives you exact result. People derive much fancier meth uh, methods, so the exponent is 3 quarter, or fact dimensionality is 4 is 1.33. So this is very nice, so simple solution. Fact dimensionality is just linear with space dimension. goes between 1 and 2 linearly as, as your space increases from 1 to 4. So that's one exercise. Any questions on this exercise? We're going to do another one very similar, so you, you, you see how the flurry model works. Any questions? Everybody is completely tired. Yes. Uh, yeah, so for example, we will see later that when d0 is equal to 4, which is uh, uh, randomly branched polymers, then you're going to see that this uh, dependence would be very different. So yes, d0 is, d0 is, if d0 is large, it, it, it wants to be more compact. Okay? Yes? 
It, it becomes completely ideal. This one is thing becomes ideal like again, above it. A lower one, but it's, it's maximally stretched. You cannot stretch it more. You're going to break your bonds. So it's, it's the lowest one, but everything is applicable. Yes. And between them, uh, chains are, s that's why real chains are important here. Ideal polymer model is fine. Below this, you can't make a, uh, a polymer. Uh, another applic similar applications, but now let's think that we are going to this magical temperature where two body interaction cancels. And then in our virial expansion, we have to include three body interactions. And so we have this uh, C cube term where uh, concentration is N over R to the D, or N, uh, number of monomers over volume. And you're talking about third virial co coefficients with some coefficient W sub D times co probability of three monomers getting together. That's what the solvent is. So you plug in your, uh, your equation for exactly the same flurry model. You minimize the particular derivative, do very simple algebra, and you find the flurry result with this type of exponent. And this is going to be also interesting and important to understand what goes on in theta solvents. So for example, for linear chains, d0 is 2. And you find the solution is now 3 over d plus 2, but now 2 over d plus 1. And so this is the uh, Flurry exponent. You can plot it again. Again, low critical dimensionality is one, then the chain is stretched. What you find is upper critical, the chain becomes ideal in three dimensions, which is lucky for us, is because exactly three dimensions is just about to become ideal. But what people, a lot of people don't realize is in theta solvent two dimensions, chains are not ideal. They're swollen and the exponent is two thirds or flat dimensionality is 1.5. So chains are, uh, uh, partially swollen in the solvent if you fit them at the at at airport interface, for example. So lower fractal dimensionality is 1, upper fractal dimensionality now is 3, and uh, that's when the chain becomes ideal, and in between it's it is uh, partially swollen, which is important to, to worry. And this is comparison of fractal dimensionality versus space dimensions. Blue is the solvent, black is good solvent or thermal solvent, and dependence is linear. Flurry theory predicts linear dependence. Fractal dimensionality starts at 1, goes to 2, and it, the equation is either d plus 1 over 2 or d plus 2 over 3. Very simple dependencies. But you need to realize that two, dim two dimensions are sometimes important when you talk about polymers confined in between plates or whatever, and you have to know what it how it behaves. Yes? Yes, right. Right. Right, so in theta solvent, it's almost ideal already in our normal solution. But in good solvent, you have to go to four dimensions, which is very hard experimentally to do. On the computer, we can do it. Huh? But solvent we'll talk about later. It's different, because this is, this is when the, this coefficient is positive. It's swelling and repelling. OK. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. So uh, what we talked about is this extruded volume parameter, which is integral of this Mayer function. Good solvent in this integral minus integral of Mayer function is positive, And chain uh, overall, most monomers want to be far away from each other, but they come close, they, d they have repulsion. See the solvent is when the two contributions, hardcore repulsion and effective attraction, completely cancel. And there's a very special temperature, a solvent condition, a mixture of solvents, when this is called the volume parameter is zero. So to body interaction, it behaves as if they don't see each other. So it's ideal like for if it wasn't connected and there was no other interaction like three body and anything else, it would be ideal like. But in reality, there are high other interaction like three body or something else, and chain is connected, so it's not quite ideal, but it's very close to it. So here the solvent is when it behaves almost like ideal chain. Yes. <laughs> no, I think this is something you have to do. I, I, I'm actually looking for good experimentalists to, to design this. Uh, yeah, I'm not talking about space plus time. I'm really talking about three spa uh, four special dimensions. No, I it hasn't been designed yet. Okay. 
So uh, how much more time do we have? Okay. 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 So uh, you saw this picture of straight polymer stretching, and uh, uh, how do we try to understand it? We pull your chain, and there is a combination of fluctuations that make chain uh, behave like polymers on a small scale. Chain want to fluctuate, entropy maxim is maximum. And there is also some average property of the chain. So you want to talk, talk about a given section of a polymer that you're trying to stretch, that you're labeling it, and you want to find out what is the size of the section. And so if you, if you have some average distance between ends R sub x, the average size of the section would be proportional to the number of monomers in this section divided by the total number of monomers in the whole chain. So this is going to be n divided, a little n is number of monomers in your section, capital N is number of monomers of the whole chain. When you stretch it, you're going to have this fraction. And so uh, the actual size is the average plus fluctuations. And chain fluctuates uh, a lot, it tries to fluctuate. And the mean square size of fluctuations for ideal chain is uh, proportional to number of monomers. This is our property that you found. I think uh, I wouldn't call it Napoleon, but this is an important property of ideal, ideal chains. And so uh, what we want to find out is what is the mean square size of our chain? The mean square size is the average of this average. Uh, sorry, it's the average of a square of the average size plus fluctuations. If you expand this into three terms, you get average of a, a square of an average, average of fluctuations, and there is a cross term that's actually zero because average fluctuation is zero. So this average square size of your uh, uh, average of a square size of your chain is square of an average plus fluctuations. And this, uh, and you can plot this as a function of little n. So I'm plugging in this result from every square. This is n of a little n of a capital N square of times r x square. Every fluctuation is at little n b square. And remember this our plots for dimensionality of the piece of paper or wire. Now I'm flipping it. This is going to be number of monomers or mass. This is size square. And you see that for s on small distances or small scales, well, any little small fluctuations dominate. And it's the uh, chain on small scales is fluctuating a lot. On large scales, it's almost linear. So fractal dimensionality goes from 2 to 1 as, different uh, as you cross over from s small scales to large scales. Very similar to we had from 3 to, to 1 for wire. And this crossover length is called tension blob. Or I think uh, Professor Gross, we call it Pinker's blob. In this case, we call it tension blob. This is where you have this uh, uh, size of this tension blob is uh, determined by this balance. It's exactly where fluctuations balance is equal to the average. On larger scale, chain is following what the force tells it to do. On smaller scales, it fluctuates and ignores what forces. The maximum entropy is, is on it wants to keep as much entropy as it can, and all, most of the entropy is on small scales. So this tension blob size is determined by this uh, uh, crossover between strongly fluctuating chain on small scales and extended chain of these blobs on large scales. And you can do the same for good solvent, same idea. You take your maximum yield, they pull the chain, and you find what it uh, is an array of these blobs. And on small scales, up to scale of this blob, it's ideal here. In case of a good solvent, or a thermal solvent, fret dimensionality is different, and so on small scale fluctuations are different. Now fret dimensionality is 1.7, or, or is one is 3 fifths. But the picture is the same. On large scales, it's, it's stretched out, ideal chain. So a uh, stretched out road like uh, array of blobs. On small scales, it just keeps its all entropy, maximal entropy. So it goes from fret dimensionality of D to the uh, fret dimensionality of 1. And you can construct this uh, dependence of forces and find the size of this uh, crossover and find the properties of this chain. I'm going to skip the algebra. And the free energy is quadratic, hooks like for ideal chain, is non hookian or nonlinear for the uh, good solvent. And the tension force, the force of which you're pulling, is exactly kt on the scale of a blob. 
And so you can find out as you pull stronger, your blow becomes smaller and the tension uh, and the length scale to which your kill fluctuations becomes smaller and smaller for the good solvent. And so the plot, if you have linear elasticity for, uh, for this uh, chain in, a, in a ideal case, you see the solvent. So force versus distance is linear like here. And it has a stronger dependence with exponent 3 half for the good solvent. And then it forces of the order kt of a monomer, which was we talked about, about uh, kt of a nanometer is about uh, four piconewtons. At this forces, the chain becomes almost fully stretched. And it doesn't matter which solvent you're doing it. But initially, your, the dependence is very different. And so you have no linear elasticity, and that's the, and this approximation fails when your strong stre becomes stronger stretched than kt over b. This is the data from Omar Saleh's uh, experiment where he was changing uh, so, uh, solvent quality by adding salt, and he saw the crossover from linear behavior to three-half-like behavior when he changed the solvent. This was using these magnetic tweezers, that the data similar to Bustamante data that uh, uh, Dr. Grosberg was showing you to you. This is just on log log scale. You can actually see the slopes. Okay. And on linear elasticity, we talked about that already. So you saw that. that as you go stronger, the force begins to diverge. For, f uh, for flexible chains, it diverges uh, with a simple pole. For this undulating chains, and the point there is that number of modes you're, you're killing is, is very different. You're undulating, and uh, with the freely jolly chain, there is no more modes on each segment here. You can still have more modes, and so it diverges stronger if it, is, it has a, a different power law of divergence. And experimentally, it, people don't know. I mean, it looks like the Jody chain works actually better for in most cases when you pull a lot. And there is some models people explain why it, why the Jody chain actually do, does work better at high forces. And uh, you also have to worry about the fact that the Kuhn length changes. Uh, if, you, if you're going from weak forces, no forces, you measure s size of a chain in solution, in a heat solvent on the melt, and then start pulling it, the cool length is, is different because of the interaction that they ignored in the mean field theory. Uh, I'm going to skip this compression story uh, because we don't have time. Uh, so they're very simple ideas. You, you, you try to confine a chain to a nanotube, and now the this crossover from fluctuations to deformation occurs on a scale which you define, which is which is confinement lengths. And the free energy in this case is again kt per length scale to which you tell chain what to do. Instead of being completely random, you're telling you have to follow a minority and go in a particular direction. And you can construct the dependence of the perpendicular directions and how it's confined. You can confine it between plates, and it's also going to behave. Uh, again, the length scale of confinement is determined by this distance between plates. Chain is ideal like if it's in a solvent or swollen if it's in a good solvent with exponent uh, three fifths, front machinality 1.7, up to a distance between plates. And beyond that, it tries to optimize its entropy. And so here you can do a same Flory theory and calculate the size of the chain in, this, uh, in between plates. And the exponent we talked about, and we derived it already, was three quarter for two dimensions. So if chain can find in a good solvent in a slit, it swells in its size now proportional to, it swells more as it gets confined. Uh, as, and, uh, and that's what happens when the chain absorbs. Absorption of the chain to the substrate is somewhat similar to confinement, except it's now confined not because of second plate, but because it likes to be next to the surface. And you can calculate the energy it gains by, uh, by being next to the surface, something called, uh, determines the absorption blob, and you calculate the entropy it loses by being confined close to the surface. And the balance of those two, entropy lost and energy gain, determines the absorption thickness of your chain, and you can also calculate the size of the chain. And uh, uh, I'm going to skip the scaling derivation. It's very, very similar concepts, and we don't want to keep you from lunch, so we'll uh, determine the length scale at which energy is about kt, determine the size of this blob. And very similar idea can be done using Flory theory. 
And flurry theory, you take your chain, you divide it into monomers, you put it in a box, calculate how many monomers in this box are, are happen to be right next to the surface, those that interact with the surface. You can count what fraction of them. It's, it's this uh, interaction distance divided by thickness of the ch a drop chain. You count number of contacts, you multiply it by the energy of the contact, you find the energy gain to being confined to the thickness H, and then there is an entropy confinement penalty. Balancing these two, you find the absorption uh, thickness, optimal thickness of absorption. Okay, so the final idea uh, I want to talk to you about is same concepts, now just how you can define chains of polymers in a given solvent using this idea of scaling crossover between two different behaviors. So let's say you ion some kind of a solvent with some excluded volume parameter V, and you want to find out at what length scale does my two-body interaction, this was this Flory expression, Kt times V is the, uh, is the entropic or energetic interaction per, per contact. This is number of contacts in, in a given volume Xi. G is number of monomers. Xi is the size of a section. When this interaction becomes an order of Kt, that means the chain can no longer be ideal. So up to Psi Xi, fact directionality is 2. Beyond Psi Xi, it has to swell or collapse depending whether attraction or repulsion is more important. So chain is ideal up to the size. By using this condition where the energy is Kt up to the scale and the chain is ideal, you have two equations with two unknowns. You find something called thermal blob, which is a very important quantity that tells you how many monomers are depending on how small or large v to the volume parameter is. So most of the volume parameter, you have to go to large scales, many monomers to get Kt. Largest to the volume, it, it, it becomes k, uh, equal to Kt much earlier. It gives you the length scale of the blob and the number of monomers in the blob. And so the chain can be represented by uh, array of those blobs. And then if blobs are interacting with Kt, it's going to be trying to avoid each other if it's repulsion. And you can construct its very simple size. It's the size of one blob times number of those blocks to power 3 fifths, it's our exponent, Flory exponent. And it gives the same exact answer as the Flory theory. Or if it's attraction, those blobs like to be next to each other, it becomes just a dense droplet of, of, of uh, touching or, uh, of, the, of thermal blobs. And so the size of the chain becomes thermal uh, size of one blob times number of blobs to power one third. So this is the picture, and so you can try to understand where it comes from by balancing entropy and energy, but if the energy is attractive, this term wants change to collapse. This term doesn't mind it to collapse, so there's really no solution. Chain goes to zero by doing Flory theory with, just, with negative fluid volume. If you, if you include confinement, it also doesn't help, because confinement is, is an, uh, cost for confinement is weaker. The cost for confinement, which is this expression here, is weaker than attraction. It goes as one of our squares, uh, the term goes as one of our cube. So balancing, you're still going to get chain collapsing. So neither confinement nor swelling entropy stabilizes collapse. So what stabilizes collapse is three-body repulsion. Because three-body repulsion, so chain goes denser, 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 and then this term here, which is three-body repulsion, because it has r over 6, when r becomes smaller, becomes more important, and it begins to balance the two-body attraction. So the size of a globular is determined by the balance of three-body repulsion and two-body attraction. By balancing those two terms, you can, in Flory theory, you're going to find the size of a globular. And that's exactly what you get from just putting dense uh, packing of those thermal blobs. So size versus number of monomers for ideal chain, uh, this on a log-log scale, slope is a half in a theta solvent. In a, a thermal solvent, you're going to get fully swollen chain. In a poor solvent, in a non-solvent chain, uh, has a, the size depends on, on molecular number of monomers to power one third. If you are now in an intermediate solvent, it follows dependence of a half for a while until you get to the blob size. And then beyond that, it, f it follows the dependence of a uh, good solvent. It's, if the it's volume is positive, or it follows behavior of a poor solvent, is, is behavior is, is dependence negative. The question I want you to think about is what the fractal dimensionality of a, of a globular in a poor solvent. 
And uh, the hint is the answer is not three. <laughs> okay, and so, the, so now you going, going back to what we started, this mayor F function has hardcore repulsion when this energy is very, very, very large. Uh, energy is much bigger than Kt, you're going to get, this term is, is zero, you're going to get minus one. When energy is small in attractive well, you can expand in Taylor series, you're going to get this uh, linear term, for example. Now you can do this integral, calculating excluded volume interactions. You do the integral of, of my RF function, integrating uh, minus one. Uh, you're gonna get, so you integrate up to the size of a hard core and attract you well. Integration of a hard core just gives you the volume of a hard core because this term is minus one, integral of this gives you just B cube. And attract you well gives you something else that, that has uh, KT in the denominator. And this integral, if you take B cube out as a, as a dimension of length, has units of temperature, and this is called theta temperature. So by doing this expansion, you can get a rough estimate of what the excluded volume parameter is, and it uh, is equal to monomer volume cube, or monomer volume, B cube, times one minus theta temperature divided by te absolute temperature. And so you can see when T is equal to theta, this thing is one, so, sorry, this ratio is 1, 1 minus 1 gives you 0. And then, depending whether you go above or below theta, you change the sign. And then one can define this interaction parameter, which is, comes from the uh, concept that it it's, is the number of contacts in a chain is proportional to n one half. We started from this, and so each of this v times n one half tells you how strongly it interacts. and. Uh, it's proportional effectively to the number of, uh, square root of number of blobs. So you can find the form of chain swelling or, uh, or collapse. So in a poor solvent, it collapse. In a good solvent, it swells compared to ideal in a way that's completely uh, dependent only on this interaction parameter. So the interaction parameter here, which is excluded volume parameter square root of n, tells you effectively the, the effect of a solvent on your chain. And so if you plot swelling, or chain of a size experimentally, or in a simulation as a function of this relative excluded volume parameter times square root of n, you get a universal dependence. It swells when, when it's positive, and it collapses when it's negative. It's very hard to measure collapse experimentally because chain f it phase separates. And you already saw this picture of how you measure osmotic pressure. And osmotic pressure is also has this contribution from uh, ideal gas of one half law, and to pairwise interaction, which tells you how monomers interact. And this second virial coefficient is effectively measured by plotting ratio of osmotic pressure and uh, one half law. The intercept gives you one of molecular weight. The slope gives you second virial coefficient. And the second virial coefficient is, if the interaction parameter is small, chains still can see, go penetrate through each other, like an ideal case, and you measure monomeric direct interactions. If a solid volume is this interaction parameter is large, chains see each other as a, 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 a repel, a, a full, they don't kind of overlap, they see they repel it from full volume, so the volume parameter is the volume of a chain. So you're going to get this function, which is, you can take a, sec a second real coefficient nor normalized by the interaction parameter as a, uh, as a function of interaction parameter, and it gives you, again, uni uni this universal plot. So just summarizing, what do we need, what have we learned about uh, real chains? Uh, in a theta solvent, chains are almost ideal. And so this is a plot of fractal dimension, or one of fractal dimension, as a function of space dimension. In three dimensions, chains are almost ideal. But be aware that in two dimensions, they are not. And this, uh, and it actually changes how much this well depends on, on, on space dimension. So you have to be careful about, say, chains are ideal in theta solvents always, the only true in, uh, when they're fr freely in th swimming in three dimensions, not in confined st spaces. Uh, so the volume parameter depends on temperature and difference of temperature with theta temperature, which is becomes almost ideal. And they swell in a good solvent as a, a self avoiding walk or swelling of uh, thermal blobs. This is the size of a thermal blob. This is how it changes uh, exp exp exponents, fractal dimensionality changes in a good solvent between 1 and 4, and V and 3, so it's about 0.6 or 5 thirds, or 
a point, 0 0.588 or 0.59. They collapse in a poor solvent. And uh, the conformations here are very interesting. And they're not self-similar in that sense. And then when you stretch, and we, didn't talk, we talked about stretching, chain stretched in a good solvent, the force dependence on distance, the free energy dependence on distance is, non, is non, non, uh, not ideal. And also when you comp compress, they, they also co get confined, and you can calculate how much energy it takes to confine the chain. That's about it. just want to finish with the point that I, there is a book. You can look where all of this is described. Yes. Uh, uh, when you are in, in a good solvent, polymers don't aggregate. Right. To, the, to form a micelle, you need to have a competition between repulsion and attraction. So polymers, that the homopolymers would not form micelle, they would either go in solutions or phase separate and form sediment and the supernatant. To form micelles, you need to have a polymer that has one section of it, like a blocker polymer, that likes solvent, another part of it which doesn't like solvent. And then this, when you go to the condition where the, uh, one part is still soluble and another part is non-soluble, then you can form a micelle at, at the conditions called uh, critical micellar temperature or critical micellar concentration, if you change this concentration. And that determines on the balance of how much they gain by, uh, by f uh, hydrophobic or lyophobic blocks getting inside the core of the micelle, how much they lose stretching out in the corona, or more importantly, what is the cost of a surface tension. And that you balance against the entropy of unimers, and balance the unimers against a chemical potential of a unimer versus chemical potential of a same chain in a micelle. In a unimer, it forms little globula of a core, single globular, and when it goes into this, so this is, so, so the chain looks like this, this block, this is the hydrophobic block, and there is a hydrophilic block sticking out. When the chains get together, they form a core, where the surface of this inter interface between a poor solvent for this polymer, uh, uh, between a solvent and a polymer, is now shared between many chains, and so per chain, the interface is gonna be smaller, and the cost of interface will be smaller. So that's what the gain of the polymer going into the micelle is reducing surface energy per chain, but it loses entropy because they all have now to be swimming together. So balance of energy and entropy gives you the, uh, the critical micelle concentration that, that people observe. And that's now you have, to, but you have to worry about both parts, the hydrophobic part in a poor solvent and the hydrophilic part in a good solvent, and, the, and two of them together balance to form a micelle. And there's a yeah, detailed discussion of that. 